I think I might get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today for the Freedom uh, W20 event. Um, my name is Zahra Hankir. I'm really honored to be hosting this event and to be in the company of such incredible women today. Um, this event is uh, focused on women's rights in Saudi Arabia ahead of W20, which Saudi Arabia uh, is hosting virtually this year. Uh, my uh, occupation is a freelance journalist. Um, I am Lebanese. Uh, I am an editor. I edited an anthology of essays by Arab women reporters that was published by Penguin Books last year. And that book really aimed to amplify the voices of Arab women journalists specifically about the incredible work that they do on the ground across the region. And I have been championing um, women's rights and amplifying the voices of Arab women specifically for the past few years of my career. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm actually hosting this event today was that I was invited by W20 to be the guardian of ceremonies, which is a fancy way of saying um, I would have been the moderator of that event. And um, I immediately saw the invitation and felt that there is no way that I could host that event, that it would be hypocritical of me um, to host that event, and that the event itself was problematic given that Saudi Arabia is hosting it. Um, so I declined to participate in the event. And then I deliberated as to whether or not I should publicly share the reason why um, I declined that invitation. And I ultimately decided the right thing would be to share the reason. And the reason is because I stand with women's rights defenders all over the world, across the region, and specifically in Saudi Arabia. And I cited Jane al Hadloul today. We are very lucky to have Lina, her sister, joining us. Um, and my feeling is that we really need to unite when it comes to being outspoken about women's rights in the region. And even if that means we have to speak out against authoritarian regimes across the region as well. Um, I'm very thankful again um, to the Freedom Initiative for inviting me. Uh, and I think we can get started. The way this is going to be structured is that each person is going to be speaking for 10 minutes. I'm going to introduce the person first, they'll speak for 10 minutes. And then at the end of it, um, we will take questions from the audience. Uh, so we're gonna start with Lina, um, who, as I said, is the sister of Lejain Havdoud. Um, Lejane obviously is one of the drivers of change in Saudi, in the Saudi women's rights movement. She's been in prison for over two years. And since she was detained in May of 2018, alongside more than a dozen other women's rights defenders, Lena has become one of the few family members willing and able to speak out on behalf of her incarcerated relative. Lena is a lawyer by training. She's based in Brussels and therefore is able to speak and travel freely. Many relatives of Saudi prisoners of conscience are subject to travel bans themselves and are living in fear of retaliation by the Saudi government. I think we all know this. Um, Lina has become a tireless advocate of Bujain and spoken to numerous media outlets at international events and as a representative to the US government and to the UN. I know Lina through Twitter. I'm so sort of proud to be on the same panel with Lina today. I really admire the work that you do, do Lina. So thank you for joining us. Um, Lina will be speaking to us um, about her thoughts on the situation in Saudi Arabia, specifically pertaining to her sister as well. Take it away, Lina. Thank you so much, Zahra. So as uh, Zahra said, I'm Lujain and Hadrul's sister. Maybe we can um, I'll start by explaining uh, Lujain's activism and arrest. Um, so Lujain was one of the leaders of uh, the Women to Drive campaign. Uh, she tried to cross the border a first time in 2014. She got arrested. And then she uh, basically broadened her act activism and uh, was campaigning um, to end the male guardianship system, which basically considers um, women as minors till the end of their lives in Saudi Arabia. But I think Hala will talk about this uh, later. Um, so Lujain was arrested without any charges at first. Um, they, they didn't even tell her why she was arrested. We didn't know where she was. And then there was a defamation campaign on Saudi newspaper labeling her a traitor, uh, saying that, that she's a foreign agent and um, without even have, having charges uh, officially. Um, so then 10 months later, her trial bega began and we were really surprised to see that uh, nothing of what they were um, uh, 
um, accusing her of in the newspaper was actually in the charges. So it's really her activism. Um, they um, they accuse her of participating to international conferences to talk about the human rights situation in, in Saudi Arabia. They accuse her of being in contact with foreign journalists, etc. And so during her arrest, um, Lujain was uh, tortured in a, an unofficial prison by Saudi officials. Um, and the thing is, they want to silence her. They want to break her. And Lujain, even behind bars, she doesn't stop uh, her fight. And she, you know, she she's been through so much horrific things like uh, waterboarding, electrocution, sexual harassment, deprivation of sleep, um, flogging, and um, and even though she went through all of this, she had the courage to to talk about it to our family and to even give uh, the name of the Saudi official who was there ordering the torture. And um, they then uh, tried to uh, make her, um, so they offered her a deal where she would uh, refuse, uh, deny the torture that she's been through and they would release her. She, she refused this so, because, you know, it's part of her fight um, to, to not de deny any of the injustices that happen in the country. And so Saudi Arabia, now that they have been uh, able to silence um, every voice basically in Saudi Arabia, first by um, silencing the activists, they, they want to be the only um, voice that is heard. So the regime wants the only voice to be his. And for that, they um, harass even the people who are abroad. So for us now, the only way to have um, the Saudi voice is heard is to speak about them and to, to show the Saudi regime that we are aware of what is happening in Saudi Arabia. So the first thing to do is, for example, I'm not always for boycott because I think we cannot cut links with another country and the conversation is the first thing that could change things. But Saudi Arabia decided to cut every link, to not be, um, to not have any context with uh, the Saudi people and with, uh, with families of detainees. So the thing is to do is to cut links with them too and to boycott everything they, they, tr they, they try to have events in Saudi Arabia. And if boycott um, is not maybe the, the solution everyone wants, um, before engaging with Saudi Arabia, the, um, people have to say, look, we know that there are prisoners in prison and these prisoners are only in prison because they um, ask for uh, human rights in the country. So please uh, first release them and then we will see if we can engage with you. Um, so that's the only way we can have our, vo our voices heard now. That's it for me today. Great, thank you. Thanks, Nina. Um, I can ask you a question now or I can come back to you at the end. Um, would you prefer now or at the end? It's, it's up to you really. Great. Well, I mean, I, I wonder what you feel Luzane would want the international community to do or what message she would want to deliver to the international community. Um, I think um, it's very difficult to, to know what she, 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 because I think she doesn't realize how the situation changed since she's in prison. I think Luzane really believed that Saudi Arabia at the time she was arrested there was still maybe uh, some place for reform by reformers, by the Saudi people. So maybe probably she would, would want to uh, people to engage with Saudi for, uh, Arabia first and not be um, maybe so public about, you know, the cases and et cetera, and try to find solutions with the Saudi regime. But probably that if she sees the situation, how it is now and how everything is bl blocked and how everyone, um, you know, is silenced, um, I think she would want her voice to be heard and to, to tell the people, you're uh, Saudi Arabia's allies, um, you should um, you know, cooperate and share some values and um, uh, not impose them, but at least uh, try to engage in the, in regarding human rights situation um, in Saudi Arabia with the Saudis and tell them um, that she should be freed and the, all the other activists should be freed and put pressure on the Saudi regime now that uh, that we, we cannot do anything else but pressure them. Sure, thank you for sharing that. I did also want to note that, you know, just the very act of solidarity, um, I think at this point in time, is actually um, a controversial act in many ways because 
there is so much pressure on people who stand in solidarity with Lujain and other women's rights defenders. I mean, personally, myself, just by the act of saying I didn't want to host that event, I was trolled and harassed online um, to an extent that I can't, it, it's difficult for me to capture it here, but I received hundreds of messages, some of which were very gendered, some of it, of, of it was sexually uh, very aggressive. Um, and, uh, you know, this is not about me at all, but I'm not even Saudi Arabia myself, but I really wanted to bring that up because I feel that, you know, the silencing is happening on so many different levels and it's not just women in Saudi Arabia, but it is, it is women everywhere and it is people who are standing in solidarity with women's rights defenders. Maybe you can comment on that briefly, Nina, as well, what you've seen when it, when it comes to people who are trying to sort of raise awareness about the situation and stand in solid, solidarity with Bujain. Yes, it's true. I mean, uh, everyone is, tr they try to silence everyone. And they, th as I said, the only voice that they want to be heard is theirs. So basically MBS and his entourage and all the, this, um, you know, narrative that they're changing uh, things in Saudi Arabia has to be um, thanks to them. Um, but basically there is nothing changing uh, as long as reformers are still in prison. And I think it's, uh, yes, they try to intimidate people into not talking about things and to, and to, to basically make them, you know, uh, give up on their fights. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you um, for sharing your thoughts today, Dina, and for all the women on the panel today for that very reason. It's so crucial that we have this discussion. Um, I'd like to move on to um, Dr. Hala Dusari. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, Dr. Hala is a, is a scholar in women's uh, social determinants of health and an activist from Saudi Arabia. She is currently based in the US. Her research and advocacy is focused on violence against women and legal reforms in women's rights. She serves as an advisory board member in several human rights organizations and has received many awards for her work on human rights, such as the Alison Day Forgus Award from Human Rights Watch and the Freedom Award from Freedom House. Her op-ed writings are featured in several international media outlets and she was the inaugural Khajogshi Fellow at the Washington Post in 2019. Um, and she will be speaking to us today about the male guardianship system and ongoing discrimination against women in Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much, Dr. Hala, for joining us today. Thank you, Zahra, and thank you very much for taking a stand. I know how difficult it is, um, you know, to stand to such a politically powerful system as that of Saudi Arabia that is very much entangled in, uh, in the media in the region at, at large, uh, you know, controlling the media, not only uh, the written media, but also the social media. And having all access to resources to silence people like yourself and others and shame them, especially women using the gendered and sexually um, suggestive languages that you've mentioned. Uh, we as activists, uh, Lujain has, has been facing that and the sisters of Lujain, once they started speaking out, speaking out you know, against the system, uh, you know, they've been facing you know, a horrible attack, exactly like the one, exactly similar to the attacks on Khashoggi. So any, uh, accountability isn't evident by um, you know a course of action that is corrected. Um, we are seeing that increasingly. We've been subjected to videos, to online uh, you know uh, discredited, um, discredited, discrediting uh, you know um, manipulations by the regime. They're portraying uh, activists as uh, people who are uh, against the country, not against the um, the um, the ill manners of the system or the. Um, the, uh, the auto autocratic nature of the system. Um, and this is where the solidarity of the world comes very helpful because if they showed solidarity with people who are calling for values of um, diversity, feminism, uh, uh, representation, that would greatly um, help those people, whether they are in prisons and exile or even people inside Saudi who were intimidated by this kind of attack um, and amplify their voices more and actually forces the regimes in the region to respect and listen um, you know, to those voices and to include them in any kinds of meaningful reforms. So for that, I wanted just to start to say thank you for your position. And of course, thank you for, for the family of Lujain that showed us an exemplary way of standing up and not caving in to intimidation. So I'm supposed to talk about the guardianship system that is um, largely promoted by the, by the regime as linked to two issues, which is the permission of a male guardian to, uh, for women to travel and the permission of a male guardian for women to marry. And it's far more deeply um, entrenched into the, the decisions of day-to-day -day lives of each woman. Um, though the government has reformed uh, 
uh, certain aspects uh, of the system in a piecemeal fashion, it didn't actually uh, entangle the system from the roots. So this is a system that is based on a patriarchal uh, power relations. Uh, basically, what, what it means is to ensure that men's authority over the women uh, decision making uh, in the family uh, is uh, protected and placed by the religious courts and by um, the practices of the state. Even if they're not written practices, uh, it's the practices of the first responders, the police officers, the uh, the media, the decision making. It's all very much like um, uh, biased against women. Uh, so the guardianship system, as I said, um, it's very much connected to the family law. So for instance, even for women who are now able to travel or to drive, if that happens against the uh, consent of their male guardian, though it's not required in the written law, uh, they, their guardian may actually uh, file a case against them of disobedience in courts, and that is possible and doable and punishable by flogging and by um, in, imprisonment. Uh, it is also entrenched into the criminal law. It means that uh, because we don't have any written penal code and the religious courts decides uh, on issues relevant to um, uh, the behaviors of the people which are not um, uh, you know, specifically um, detailed in the uh, religious um, text, uh, they have uh, like an authority under something called ta'zir or the discretion of the judge to decide whatever punishment they seem uh, they, they deem fit. For instance, things like um, the dress code of the women, though there is now more of a relaxed, um, there is no religious police ruling the cities in, in, in Saudi Arabia, but women who might challenge this dress code norms, of, even though they're not uh, dressed in um, in an unacceptable way, even though there are more foreign women now used by the regime to promote fashions, to promote at, at historical sites, and appear in a very much like um, very uh, controversial dress code. But Saudi women themselves, when they try to follow suits or when they try to use you know, this kind of ease of restrictions to uh, push for a different dress code or, or basically use those kinds of um, uh, you know, newly found uh, you know, presence in the in the in the public spaces, they often faced with um, you know very much like either online harassments or either um, you know uh, uh, harsh uh, harsh uh, the, uh, criminal system. And we've seen several women being uh, dragged into uh, into the system because of this. Um, the guardianship system also uh, is very much linked to violence against women. Violence against women is embedded in the unequal relations between men and women in the family, which makes escaping abusive family very difficult for women if her guardians controls not only her access to other resources, but her access to other services. For instance, many women who have to uh, get the consent of a guardian for tra travel, for instance, they have to give him money to do so, or if uh, they don't want to compromise their um, custody of their children, they have to consent to, to their guardian's um, uh, decision making in other aspects of their life. So because the guardian uh, authority over a, a woman's life is very much like uh, extended over so many choices, it makes it more difficult for women to uh, challenge them in one particular choice or aspect. And this has been mentioned in the special repertoire uh, of, on violence against women after her visit to Saudi Arabia when she uh, cited several uh, stories like one woman, one child who has been uh, a girl who has been um, sexually abused and you know um, raped by her by her father, and she had to run away. Uh, her father filed a case against her that she's absent from home, which is basically uh, running away is punishable by law. Um, and the court did not uh, heed her uh, claim of uh, of sexual abuse or rape, but focused on uh, the fact that she ran away from home and ordered her imprisonment. Again, if she's imprisoned, she needs a mahram or someone who's a relative to get her out of prison or shelters. Uh, shelters themselves and themselves very difficult to access. Um, there are strict regulations on who gets to be uh, protected in a shelter. Shelters are treated exactly like um, prisons in terms that women are not able to um, get out of them on their own, uh, are un unable to have access to internet or speak about or find resources uh, about her case online. Uh, they're heavily monitored uh, places, um, and they're very much limited in the services that they provide. That many women are coerced into finding, uh, um, you know, a way like marriage, for instance, or having to go to a di distant relative uh, custody, and she end up, of course, after that, back to her abuser, uh, in order to get out of those shelters. Uh, so this is another problem, and this is where uh, 
uh, Lujain, for instance, and the other women activists, because they got a lot of requests for help from other women, were trying to push inside Saudi Arabia for the civil society to take a lead in providing shelter services with legal services that is uh, not conditional, not you know, where access is not conditional on uh, a certain criteria. You know, any woman who feels that she's at risk can access the shelter. Uh, women who have children, male children over seven years, they can also access the shelter. Foreign women who are not allowed into sh Saudi shelters can also access the shelters. Um, and this application has been uh, ongoing for two years against the regulation of the uh, law of association in Saudi Arabia without any kinds of um, acceptance from the state, which shows again, uh, the state is not really intent on um, uh, allowing the civil society to be part of the reform or allowing them to have an influence over the Saudi society. And this has been the case uh, forever. Um, also, the system uh, is interacting with the sponsorship system or intersecting with the sponsorship system. And I'm sure um, Bethany would talk more about that in terms of the uh, who gets to exit from Saudi Arabia. The system at whole, you know, the, the buildup of the system, the patriarchal and the hierarchical, uh, you know, position of the system of women in the, in the system is very much similar to that of the ruling family, the absolute monarchy that controls people and only those who are permitted to do certain things, to speak about certain things, to access certain positions are those who are allowed by uh, the monarch here, the MBS or King Salman. Uh, so it's very much like a similar uh, system that is uh, copied of the uh, mentality of the uh, of the um, of the governess or the mentality of the ruling system, um, and that's, this is why we never saw the aggressiveness of the system against any group of detainees. There are so many people in Saudi Arabia, as Arij will mention, um, uh, so many people in Saudi Arabia are targeted by Saudi regime since the ascent of Mohammed bin Salman to uh, to become a crown prince. But we did not see any aggressive uh, or brazen, basically, um, behavior in targeting any group, as we've seen with the women activists. We've seen them, uh, you know, being smeared in campaigns. We've seen them treated treated as uh, traitors, actually worse than um, the radical uh, terrorists. Uh, they've been subjected, as Lujain has mentioned, to horrible forms of torture, the ultra-investigative techniques invented by the, the FBI, basically, in, in the U.S., uh, so we've seen all those issues, um, you know, coming in their case. And of course, the fact that uh, even when those cases were brought to Mohammed bin Salman and to other officials, those officials haven't been uh, consistent in um, the story that they talk about. Um, you know, for instance, they have been, uh, really, the arrest has been related to Qatar. The arrest has been related to uh, meeting with uh, diplomatic missions or to having, uh, you know, tarnished the reputation of the country because they spoke about issues relevant to women's rights or because they campaigned publicly, like Lima bint Bandar, which is the first Saudi ambassador in the U.S. said, how can you campaign basically uh, in a system that is closed to Saudi Arabia where you don't have any access, any channels to access the decision-making entities? How can you campaign, you know, privately? It's kind of impossible. So it means you're re removing the agency of people and making it, uh, you know, the, making the people only recipients of those kinds of decisions. So we've seen that even when women were allowed into decision-making uh, positions or in influential positions, they've actually been doing uh, more service to the regime than the cause of women's rights. Here comes the, uh, a quote I'm taking from Blood and Money that I've just been uh, reading, uh, a book that has been uh, published recently on Mohammed bin Salman ascent to power and how he consolidated power over certain sweeps on, you know, um, of arrest or dealing with the business community. He was PR campaign, as Zahra mentioned, where They've looked at most neat, uh, reputable names, whether it's in the media, whether it's in the sport or arts, to come to Saudi Arabia. And the problem comes when they present themselves in, uh, in light that is very um, distant from reality. So one of those people who decided to stand up for the regime, he's a, a foreign uh, businessman. He said, I look at the sweeping liberalization of the country and I see that this could not be the full story and we can't stop dealing with Mohammed bin Salman just because of one incident of brutal killing or grisly killing of a journalist in a consulate. And this very much like, uh, you know, um, uh, tells us the story of uh, the liberalization of the country, which has been sold to the world again uh, before that by the United Arab Emirates by showing that, you know, the people in, in the United Arab Emirates are very much like free to roam the place. They, there is no dress code, uh, you know, the best of technology, the best of, you know, entertainment are available. But then people themselves, the story of the people of the land themselves are very much hidden. Nothing is being said about, uh, for instance, the um, 
people in of Neom who are being uh, pushed into uh, a brim so that Muhammad bin Salman can have his futuristic city. People have been killed. People have been, uh, you know, uh, placed in prisons. Uh, so all these stories are not part of the narrative. The narrative that I'm going to bring liberalization, but I'm going to be the only one who's speaking for it. And this liberalization, the control on the base of the reform, the control on what gets to be on the political agenda is only mandated by Mohammed bin Salman who have been proving more and again to be unlawful, to be someone who is antagonistic um, to reformers themselves um, and to the, to the people of his own country. And how can you trust a system where the court system is very much, or a, or a regime where the court system is very much controlled by one authoritarian man? Uh, I mean, for business community, for the arts community, for the sport washing, this is a very much like an alarming thing. And it has been evident from the fact that Saudi Arabia hasn't been able to invite investment more of what we, we did. We spent so much resources on the PR. We spent so much investment. We, we invested as Saudi Arabia in so many different U.S. countries and, and U.S. Uh, companies and, uh, and other uh, Western economy without having to achieve our goals of having investors feel trust in the system enough to come and live within Saudi Arabia. And this is the, uh, this is actually the telling thing that uh, if you feel like you can't be safe under Mohammed bin Salman, why are you standing on his way? Why are you riding his wagon basically? Uh, thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hala. That's, um, I'm so sorry that I, I just stopped you there. I think you might've had something else you wanted to say, but we're, um, we're at time. Do you want to add anything before I move on to Bethany? Yes, you can, you can move to Bethany. Okay, thank you so much for, for those thoughts. Um, we'll come back to you at the end to discuss a little bit more. There's so much that you said there and I would highly recommend that book that you mentioned as well. It's an excellent book. Um, Bethany uh, al Haydari is um, a PhD candidate in international human rights law with the National University of Ireland, focusing on Saudi Arabia. She holds a master's in Middle East and Islamic studies from the American University of Paris. She conducted human rights research in Saudi Arabia for nearly a decade and previously worked as a journalist covering Saudi Arabia from on the ground. After a legal battle in Saudi, litigating her own divorce and later a complex custody case, she witnessed extreme discrimination in Saudi courts herself. She returned to advocate for women and children facing human rights violations in Saudi Arabia with several human rights organizations. She is now the Saudi desk officer at the Freedom Initiative. And today she will be discussing understanding Saudi government's women's uh, rights violations as a global issue. Thank you so much, Bethany. Thank you, Zahra. Um, and I just, again, want to say that I'm so honored today to be alongside um, these incredible women's rights activists and grateful to the Freedom Initiative for putting on um, this event. So um, I also think it's important to, again, take a moment at every chance that we get uh, to call for the release of the Saudi women's rights activists and prisoners of conscience within Saudi Arabia that are currently detained. Um, as this kind of focuses on the W20 event and giving it a legitimate voice to what is actually the reality on the ground. I do think, again, just to, to call for the release of Lujain al Hathloul, Samar Badawi, Nof Abdelaziz, and so many others who remain in prison, but also it's really important to be aware that even the others who were released while facing baseless allegations in courts remain deprived of their liber liberties and dignities. Several are under travel bans and have been forced to go silent. Um, and there are also so many women who, like I once was very recently, um, are being wrongfully held against their will by husbands or employers who are their kefil or sponsor in the country or because of restrictions on male guardianship laws and limitations to what they can do with their children. Um, and the majority of, of women and children who are in these situations are within immediate um, situations of abuse and unable to find recourse in Saudi courts, just like uh, Dr. Hala has, has drawn awareness to. Um, having said that, um, as you mentioned, I, I worked um, doing human rights research on the ground um, and collecting and, and analyzing ethnographic research and teaching at a few universities and working as a freelance journalist. And though I am a US citizen, um, being married to a Saudi citizen, and I founded and owned a small business in Riyadh as a foreign investor, um, as the mother of a, of a dual Saudi and US citizen, um, 
I still was subject to so many limitations of my rights and going through the court system and seeing what was happening to women and children alongside me and being helped um, by women in, in the courts. Um, it was quite shocking to me and even being in courts, how degrading and dehumanizing that experience is and how women are currently not treated as fully human. Um, especially in regards to even trying to prove uh, allegations of, of abuse um, when your word is not accepted and, and a man is able to simply swear or bring, bring witness, male witnesses to court to say that his version of events is correct. So it creates an impossible situation for women who are on the ground in Saudi Arabia, regardless of their background, um, to be able to protect themselves and their children. And the legal system is just not set up to efficiently do that. Um, so today I did want to speak a, a bit about why we as a global community have to come together to tackle women's rights violations in Saudi Arabia as a global issue that impacts all of us. Um, and I truly mean, I truly mean it when I say that these issues do, especially in today's global reality, um, and can impact everyone and it's therefore our responsibility. So I'll just kind of dive into four different reasons today. Um, why these issues can, can impact us all and why we have to come together to demand better for women and children and everyone um, in the law on the ground in Saudi Arabia. And um, the first thing that I'll, I'll just start to point out is um, that Saudi courts don't recognize any authority of foreign jurisdictions or international um, legal bodies. So in the, the, the Saudi law of procedures in the courts, chapter one, article 24 literally states, the kingdom's courts have jurisdiction over cases filed against the Saudi, even if there's no record of his general or designated residence in the kingdom. And the Saudi law of the judiciary, which in part one, article one states that um, judges are subject to no authority other than the provision of Sharia, and no one has the right to interfere with the judiciary. Um, and we know in, in engagements with international courts that um, the Saudi government has traditionally used Islamic law as an escape clause um, and a, a, a wrongful crutch, um, even in situations where interpretations of Islamic law do, uh, do uphold principles of human rights values which we saw with the, uh, the issue of women driving, um, it's used as a clutch. So it's important for us to realize that Saudi courts don't recognize any foreign authority, um, any foreign jurisdiction. They co claim complete jurisdiction and control over anyone holding a Saudi citizenship, um, regardless of their connection to Saudi Arabia. And that's a frightening reality for anybody looking to be involved uh, or to marry a Saudi, a Saudi male and that has nothing to, to say about Saudi males in general, like human beings are human beings, but when you have a system of discrimination that legally uphold, upholds that discrimination, then it's a scary reality that has to be taken into consideration for women who do um, have any sort of involvement with, with the government or any risk of being involved with that legal system. And, and the second is that, um, we can see that it's essentially a lawless state, which gives itself a, a green light um, to do what it wants without any, any form of international accountability. We, we saw that with the murder of Jamal uh, Khashoggi, but we can also see with the ongoing detention of innocent women's rights activists and other prisoners of conscience that have been detained regardless of their citizenship um, that are being held. So with Saudi law, not recognizing the authority of other jurisdictions, it's not a safe place to be involved with in this global reality or to invest in because you are subjecting yourself to being exactly under the same um, horrific <laughs> human rights violations that have happened to so many. The second is that um, women and children from all countries, um, even men, but more so women and children from all countries could be trapped in Saudi Arabia under the kafala system and the male guardianship systems. Um, and I'll just take the, why we should care about the male guardianship system in regards to a children's rights issue. Now the kafala system is a system of foreign sponsorship and it requires every foreign resident um, in Saudi Arabia to be under the sponsorship of either their employer or their spouse or a Saudi citizen. And that sponsor has 
significant ownership rights over that individual's life. So they need the sponsor controls if they can exit or enter the country, the sponsor can deport this person. They, they control their access to healthcare, to bank accounts, can report them as a runaway and are required to get them out of prison. So this is in regards to foreign, you know, foreign citizens working in Saudi Arabia or married to Saudi citizens or, or residents. Um, the male guardianship laws um, apply to any, any female born to a Saudi father. Um, and they require, as, as Dr. Hala had said, it, it's until death uh, at the moment. Um, so they require permission to marry from the male guardian. And even in cases when a father is deemed dangerous or unfit to parent a child, he remains the male guardian of that child. So even if mothers have won physical custody, which is the only right that they currently have in Saudi laws over their children, um, custodial mothers are in effect unable to control or properly protect their child in their care since the men maintains guardianship of the child and control over that. So there was a congressional hearing um, on issues within Saudi Arabia with uh, the State Department uh, reporting um, that there were over 90 cases of US citizen mothers and children in 2002 that were trapped and being held against their will in Saudi Arabia in situations of violent abuse by Saudi husbands or fathers that they were aware of in 2002. So since I personally got out of Saudi in, in ju just last December, so not even a year ago, since February of 2020 alone, I've had 43 documented cases of individuals reaching out to me of women and children that are, are from the United States alone, even though there's several more that reached out as well that are in similar circumstances. So um, almost all of the cases were in situations of violence um, and abuse. And as uh, Dr. Hala has already said, uh, tourists and visitors to Saudi Arabia are living under a completely different reality than Saudi citizens or residents in Saudi Arabia of all nationalities. So 2019, there was a few announcements that dress code had changed, that tourists would be welcome. Um, women were still being arrested for public indecency laws, myself included. Um, and women were losing parental rights in courts for not covering their face. So while tourists um, or you know, celebrities were coming to Saudi Arabia, at that exact same timeline, there were still people being arrested um, and, and others losing rights to their children for not covering their face when men are, are permitted to be abusive in courts with, with almost no form of accountability. So the male guardianship system threatens any child with male relatives in Saudi Arabia. Um, and while the US has had held hearings on this, such as the, the 2002 congressional hearing um, on abductions of children from the United States to Saudi Arabia, we've kind of missed th that um, we also need to be pushing and supporting this because male guardianship system facilitates the kidnapping of children from all around the world to Saudi Arabia by their fathers with impunity. And that's from Ireland, England, Senegal, Kenya, the United States, the Philippines, Australia, so many cases. And we know that the Saudi consulates and embassies have facilitated this process by assisting in issuing laissez passes or temporary travel documents to children of Saudi males without the knowledge of the custodial mothers and in violation of US court orders. Um, male guardianship gives Saudi men the right to kidnap their children with, with impunity to Saudi Arabia. So the last point that I think is, is really important is to remember is that Saudi Arabia is not a free country and citizens and residents are silenced. And this is especially the case for women who not only face government repercussions, but are under the control um, of a male family member whom the Saudi legal system gives immense power to over their female defendants to the point that it puts them in danger of financial abuse, manipulation, exploitation, um, and, and physical and emotional abuse as well. So it's not fair for us to ask people on the ground what's happening in Saudi Arabia to put their life at risk, to put their family's life at risk, um, to speak out under that regime. So therefore it is it's absolutely the international community's responsibility to amplify the voices of Saudi citizens in the diaspora who are free to speak and to continue the conversations and demands that were started before this crackdown by women's rights activists and by Saudis who were calling for various human rights um, to be implemented in Saudi. And we need to be sure to amplify all cases that impact US citizens, that impact anywhere, the Philippines, 
Philippines um, that impact people who are stuck from Kenya. This is a global issue and we can't ask people to risk their lives. So it's up to us to amplify the message and the conversations that were started. So Saudi yeah. Arabia, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were wrapping up. Sorry, Bethany, please go ahead. We're just a bit tight on time. Just wanted to let you know. Okay, so I will just say that um, a few summary points on my own PhD dissertation and surveys that, that were received. So um, I did anonymous surveys while I was living in Saudi Arabia, and I just wanted to note some of the results. So from those, and I'll just um, say that um, we did hundreds of surveys and 74% of the Saudi citizens that were surveyed at that time believed that they um, needed to implement freedom of religion. 82% believed that they needed to implement freedom of speech. 65% um, of the respondents said that they believed that Saudi Arabia should embrace the International Human Rights um, Convention. And only 32% agreed that the Saudi legal system was actually implementing uh, aspects of Islamic law. 99% said that freedom was important to them, and 87% said that they didn't feel safe to criticize the Saudi government. 91% that their freedoms and rights were being limited in Saudi, and 68% um, said that policies in Saudi are not made with the, the citizens' best interests in mind. So I'll just say and leave with that that, you know, there's a responsibility for all of us to amplify this message and to continue this fight. And I'll leave it to Ari to go on and Zahra. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. I think crucial really to what you were saying, and you, you made that point, is that the narrative that the global community receives about the country is not reflective of what happens inside the country. And I think that distinction is quite important. That's not necessarily limited to Saudi Arabia, it's other countries as well across the region. But we really need to be cognizant of what we're hearing from these governments and then what might actually be happening on the ground. So that's really a message I want the listeners to, to take um, with them today. Um, we're moving on to um, Adija Sadhan. Thank you, Adija, so much for joining us today. Um, Adija is a dual American and Saudi citizen who lives in San Francisco and works in the tech industry. Her brother, Abdurrahman, a, human, a humanita humanitarian aid worker and graduate from the Bay Area University with a business degree, was kidnapped from his office at the Red Crescent in Riyadh by the Saudi authorities during a mass crackdown on critics and human rights activists. He was tortured and deprived from any communication with his family, and he's been missing since March 12, 2018. Since his detention, he was allowed only a one-minute call after 23 months of his disappearance and then went missing again. Adish has been working tirelessly to demand justice for her brother, whose only fault was expressing his peaceful opinions on social media. Adish spoke at several events at the UN and a US congressional conference expressing concerns about the worsening situation of human rights conditions in Saudi Arabia. And today, Adish will be speaking to us about the impact the situation um, there has on families and businesses um, of arbitrary detention uh, relatives uh, in Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Zahra, and uh, thank you to Freedom Initiative for uh, hosting this event, a very important event. Um, and I just want to mention that, uh, Zahra, thank you also for standing up for human rights and um, the, the backlash that you got from the Saudi trolls is actually very embarrassing as a, as a you know, anyone who lives in Saudi or, or is a Saudi citizen is actually very embarrassing that while they are saying that we protect uh, or we are improving women's rights, what they have done in terms of online attacks, abuse, you know, verbal abuse is completely against any women's rights, you know, um, in, in that regard. So um, it is really, uh, uh, you know, um, amazing to see women like you standing up for women's rights and speaking about it publicly, because the only way we can tackle these issues is by keeping, you know, our voices heard. Um, uh, I'm greatly hurt and affected by the human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia, even though I live in the US, even though I'm an American citizen, but yet those human rights abuses have reached us over here. And as uh, Zahra have mentioned early, you know, in the intro, I am uh, the sister of a humanitarian aid worker, Abdurrahman Sadhan, who have been detained from his uh, place of work at the, at the uh, Red Crescent uh, headquarters in Riyadh and disappeared since uh, 2018 uh, March. 
So it's been right now 31 months since his disappearance. And during all of that time, he was allowed only one minute call to my family in Riyadh. Uh, that have impacted us greatly, uh, especially the woman in the family and specifically our mother. So that actually make me think about all the other women in Saudi Arabia who cannot even speak, all the other mothers who are suffering as a result of these human rights abuses. Um, enforced disappearance is a major human rights violation. Um, taking, kidnapping someone's daughter or, or uh, a, a son uh, or their father or mother or children um, have a huge impact on all of the family and specifically on the mothers and the people who are you know, directly related to, to these um, uh, victims. It could be mothers, it could be wives, it could be daughters. Um, you know, so it does touch on women's rights directly and it does, does affect women's rights directly. Um, it's basically crippling for the entire family. Uh, so, for example, say for those who lose their, uh, their husbands and they're disappeared and out of the blue, they just kidnapped and uh, being disappeared. How, how is that mother going to take care of the children? How she's going to, you know, their entire life is going to shift completely um, for, a, for a mother who just doesn't know where her son or daughter went and disappeared for, for weeks and weeks. And until later, find out that they are being kidnapped by the secret police and then they're deprived completely from any communication. How would that affect them? It, it actually, you know, it, it is a major human rights violation on a large, large scale. So um, it, it, when we talk about human rights, it, it is crucial that we talk, you know, like all of you have touched upon that it, it actually all interconnected. Women's rights is affecting everyone else's rights. Uh, human rights, anyone whose human rights violated is affecting anyone, you know, in, in the society effect, it, it reveals. So, um, and as long as we cannot speak about it, and th this goes into freedom speech, as long as people cannot speak about it on the ground, it just keeps amplifying and getting worse and worse. Um, so there is no, there is no uh, transparency, there is no voices that can point out these human rights violations, even if it wasn't intended, but obviously in Saudi Arabia it is intended. So even if it wasn't intended, when you silence people, you allow these, you, you allow these violations to continue and get worse. And of course, it hurts everyone. It hurts the country. It hurts businesses. It hurts people's lives. It hurts families. Um, so our case is just one of many, many cases out there. Many families in Saudi Arabia are being separated, are being tortured, are being hurt by these um, actions and these violations. Uh, my brother is just one case of many other enforced disappearance cases. He was subjected to torture, which is also a huge human rights violation. Uh, there was no um, in independent investigators allowed to go and check on these uh, um, prisoners, which basically adds to the story that why they don't want them to contact their families because of the abuse they are facing, whether it's, you know, physical abuse, uh, dep deprivation from, you know, their basic rights and, uh, you know, physical abuse, threats of murder, you name it. So, um, and that also goes further. Uh, in my brother's case, he was hacked. He was spied on and he was hacked. And that was done by, uh, you know, um, attacking a foreign company, attacking an American company. Uh, and we all know it's Twitter. So Twitter was uh, uh, actually not the only one who actually suffered from these attacks. There are other tech companies and I live in the, in the Bay Area. So the, uh, at the center of all of uh, these issues, it's always one of the topics that are highly, you know, touched upon the s safety and the security of, of, you know, these companies and the, of course, the people who uses them. So um, Saudi Arabia's name always coming up in the discussion as one of the countries that are posing serious risk on, on freedom of speech, companies that promote freedom of speech. Uh, social media companies are there to promote freedom of speech to help people stay uh, you know, connected, uh, to bring people together, to allow them a space to speak freely. And when you receive such attacks, you're actually saying that I'm against those you know, type of businesses, I'm against those type of uh, principles. Um, so, and the other message is, you know, it shows that the Saudi Arabian government is not respecting any, um, any rules in terms of business partnership. 
So when you go above and beyond to hack and to, to spy on foreign company just to go after people to silence them and that is not just only Saudi citizens after journalists after international people who are internationally just because they dare to criticize Saudi Arabia so the risk is really huge and in in, in directly or indirectly this is affecting businesses who will want to invest in Saudi Arabia and uh, of course um, you, you know the, like Hala have mentioned Foreigners don't feel safe in Saudi Arabia with these rules. When we have uh, hypocrisy in terms of how rules are implemented on the ground between <clears throat> Saudi citizens or uh, you know non-Saudi citizens, um, you don't feel safe because you don't know. There is no clear law. The law can be abused and can be manipulated. So how do you feel safe um, <clears throat> visiting Saudi Arabia? And how do you feel safe even investing in Saudi Arabia? And the other thing is also um, the, the hypocrisy. I mean, for people who have conscious, they'll be wondering how are citizens really living? If I'm giving certain you know, uh, freedoms because I'm not a Saudi uh, and Saudis are being oppressed because, just because they hold a Saudi citizenship, it's like you know, um, treating them like slaves just because you're a Saudi citizen. Okay, now you're a slave. You have to follow a different type of rules and different type of restrictions. So, uh, you know, for people who think about these things, they will be they will be questioning that, and they will be um, they will not feel comfortable to visit a, a country that is not you know is not treating people fairly in terms of their laws and regulations. Uh, so that's that's in in general um, uh, you know um, we can we can talk forever about that, but I don't want to run over time. But so that's in general uh, my points uh, and two major things is how is this affecting especially mothers and women who are uh, relatives of detainees um, and the other thing is how is this majorly affecting uh, the reputation uh, of uh, you know doing businesses with uh, with Saudi Arabia of course those companies don't want to be involved in legal actions as well because obviously the, uh, the you know the those violations uh, to the extent where they are involved in legal actions like with the Twitter case um, and there are other cases as well so these companies down the line they don't want to be tangled into these legal issues uh, and affect their reputation affect their own businesses um, and you know it, it is like I mentioned earlier it's a butterfly effect it can you know continue to escalate and continue to get bigger and bigger unless it's tackled and you know uh, taken care of um, from the roots so that's that's for me um, thank you Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arish. We have a question from the audience, but I'm actually first going to ask you a question and then pose the audience question to all of you. Um, and you, you, you know, the, the subject of what you just discussed is how this has affected women um, and, you know, the families of these detainees. And I'd love it if you could, if you don't mind, if you could share how it's personally affected you, how you've contended with this yourself and the struggles that you faced. Um, especially given that you that you live in the United States, you're a, a dual nationality as well. Um, it must be tremendously difficult for you, and also um, Lina as well. If Lina would like to chime in, if we have time. Um, and then the question is from uh, Robert, and I think anyone can really answer this question. It's quite vast. Um, how dangerous is it for panelists to be speaking here today, knowing the reach of MBS to silence criticism abroad? So maybe Ariz, you can answer the question, then whoever else wants to answer this, the audience question afterwards, that would be great. Sure, so the first question, uh, it actually impacted us greatly. It impacted it impacted me personally on a on a diff, on different levels in terms of um, you know our personal life, my family life, and uh, our health. Uh, of course, the most person being affected by this was my mother, and uh, this has added pain to my own personal pain because I have to show strength in front of my mother the whole time, and you know take to do that. I have to take care of myself first to be able to show that. So it affected, you know, the way I, you know, go about my life. Uh, you know, I had to shift my schedule completely. I have to shift my life around my work, my personal life, everything to accommodate and to, to make space to take care of ourselves as a result of this, you know, um, uh, basically violation. Um, 
it affected our health greatly, especially for my mom. Uh, I personally had to take time off work because I was in a very bad shape. I had to take care of my own health. So um, it, it, it is the effect of that is really huge. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, people tell me that I have resilience and I'm, you know, a patient. And yet it really hit me hard and it hit my, you know, especially seeing my mother suffering is, is not easy. Uh, so how about all these other people who are not even, you know, um, you know, who, who's not even having that level of patience? How would they deal with it? Um, on, to answer the other question, the second question, um, our life as we speak is in danger <laughs> day to day. We are, we are taking a huge risk by speaking up, but the risk of say, staying silent is much bigger, at least from my point of view. And the first day I decided to, to speak up, I basically joined Twitter and I posted um, after, after just you know, watching what's going on and you know, following up on how people are you know, uh, handling issues on Twitter, I decided, okay, it's time that I'm gonna just you know, take the courage and, and speak about it publicly because all the doors were closed in our faces. So I posted, where is my brother? I, sh I posted a short tweet and basically it was, you know, the main thing is, where is my brother? And I got this enormous, crazy amount of attacks, similar to what you received, Zahra, unfortunately. Uh, it was a, a mixture of, of verbal abuse, gender discrimination, um, threats of murder, um, uh, saying even that we're going we're gonna to get you and throw you in the sewers. Basically, you know, threats of murder that they're going to get me and bring me back to Saudi Arabia and throw me in the prison sewers. So um, that was really scary to see. But at that point, I thought, you know what? There is no going back. If I stay silent now, this is, this is it. My life is going to be in danger forever. But if I speak up, then at least people know about me. And if anything happens, at least people know what we are going through. And, you know, regardless, I'm in danger now and I can't go back. I just have the only way I can go is just keep going forward and keep speaking up. Uh, so, yes, there is a huge risk on us speaking here. Um, as long as there is restrictions and there is, um, you know, attack on freedom of speech, everyone is at risk. Uh, whether in Saudi Arabia, of course, in Saudi Arabia is much huge, much bigger risk because, you know, the moment you even criticize the simplest thing, you can end up in jail and disappeared and tortured. Um, and outside Saudi Arabia, you can risk being kidnapped. You can risk being attacked. You never know. I mean, you know, we've heard different different stories of people being targeted, um, whether kidnapped or uh, you know uh, attacked or uh, you know, you never know. It's 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 it is risky. But you know, there's no other option but to keep speaking up. Thank you for your courage and your bravery, Arish. I appreciate it. We are at time, but I just wanted to give the remaining panelists a chance to answer um, either one of those questions, really, how the situation has affected you personally or how you feel about the risk of speaking today. Um, we don't have much time, but please do share your thoughts if you'd like to. Just in consideration of time, I'm just going to say one thing. There are thousands and thousands of best of uh, Saudi Arabia's, um, you know, um, basically people are rounded up in prison, people who have been pushing for religious reforms, people who were criticizing the economic policies that created more and more uh, inequality, like disparity, people who have been pushing, the women reformists, you know, the women's rights activists who have been pushing the envelope, taking a huge risk uh, in their own lives and continuing the fight for others. And I think it's a tribute, what we're doing, what, what risk we're taking is a tribute to those people and uh, it's not, as, as Arij uh, eloquently said, it's not a choice of staying silent or, you know, you know, you can't really afford to stay silent because it will become more and more of an entrenched behavior of the regime. It will, be, it will become accepted. People will be desensitized if no one knows what's happening. The PR will take, of course, the, uh, the front uh, space, the, the stage, basically. And whatever the regime is saying will be the only narrative out there and no one will be able to see the reality on the ground. And this is why those events and the, and the voices of people uh, are very much important. And I can just speak volume, but I don't want to think, you know, the, about us having to force our lives after investing so much in our, uh, you know, in education, uh, you know, for someone who has been studying the Saudi women, the violence against women in Saudi Arabia, who had to shift their life away after threats, you know, of arrests and detention. 
and had to stay in in, in, in the U.S. and starting new. And this is something you know most of us are. Of course, we can testify to the to the hurdles of having to resettle in a different place to um, you know shift their lives, as Arij mentioned, and having to basically deal with um, our, our responsibilities from abroad um, and putting other people at risk because those people inside who are trying to reach out to tell us their grievances also at risk. So at least the, the least we can do is to amplify their voices and support them in their fights and they basically uh, search and quest for justice. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Hala. Uh, on the, yes, Lina, please go ahead. Um, so as uh, Arij and Hala said, it's, I mean, it's uh, really, um, horrible for the families and we we live in a daily hell you know when I just imagine what Hujain is going through it it kills me inside but I also want to add that it's not only about you know the direct victims the direct detainees that are being targeted as I said so we are um, on a daily basis we get um, we are harassed basically on Twitter and um, basically on Twitter and um, also, um, the problem is that now um, they also target the families um, with legal procedures, so for, for illegal procedures, basically, because, uh, for example, our family have been put on a travel ban since Lujan was also on a travel ban at the beginning. And it's, um, it's very, um, I mean, we're scared, we're terrified every day, uh, thinking that maybe the, the travel ban is to be able to arrest them later, because what we have been seeing is that that's the procedure Saudi Arabia has. So first they put on a travel ban and then they arrest. So um, yes, I want to add. So what I wanted to say is that um, they have they they are also targeting families now, and um, travel bans are really 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 scary um, because they can, they can be the first step before getting arrested. Well, thank you, um, Lina, for sharing your thoughts there and all the difficulties that your family are going through. Um, and, and really all of you on the panel today are incredible women and I appreciate you taking part in this really important discussion. And on the subject of amplifying voices, I hope everyone who's joined the talk today will follow everyone here on Twitter and on social media to really amplify the work that these women are doing. And also to check out the Freedom Initiative's website. They have something called the Freedom Pledge, which advocates uplifting stories of people who are striving for basic human rights and dignity and pledging to be a part of that amplification. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining um, and for being patient with us for going over time a little bit. Bye bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.